said the committee is this much in alignment. Whenever we're told it's going to be a boring year, uh, that's when surprises often come. Do you think it's going to be as mild a Fed bat drop as we think? Well, I mean, it's a good baseline expectation. I think it's a solid way to start. We're certainly ending the year on a high note, both in the markets and in the economy. The latest labor market data was fantastic. Uh, but we do have a lot of uncertainties. So the trade war was one that Steve mentioned. But the original uh, impetus for the global slowdown was China reining in its excess credit growth. And China's dealing with a lot of bad loans and some bank failures. And so far, they've managed to keep the, the train on the tracks with their economy. But it's far from a foregone conclusion. This is, this is a lot of uncertainty for the Chinese economy, which is the bellwether for the global manufacturing uh, cycle. So that's a big uncertainty. Fading fiscal stimulus is one in the U.S. The budget deal that was passed is fine, but the, the fading uh, impulse from the tax cut and ultimately we aren't going to get as much growth off of federal spending as we did last year. So we're really kind of looking at this trend like growth picture and that leaves very little margin for error if something goes wrong. Steph, how do you think about it? I know you've been... Uh what, overweight cyclicals, to Bullish. say the least? <laughs> Bullish, uh, yes. believing that uh, yeah. the global economy has bottomed. Is that still how you see it going into 2020? Yeah, I do. I'm, I look at China, and I look at what they just did over the weekend, and that's just confirming that they continue to put the metal, pedal to the metal on stimulus in one way or the other. That, in turn, should help global growth. It should help emerging markets. Also on Europe, let's see what Lagarde and how, how she starts to her whole policy initiative. So I think you have a lot of things happening globally next year that could actually support price growth to the upside. I don't know about here. I don't know about the U.S. and especially at the valuations in U.S. So if anything, I think the cyclicals do outperform because they are cheaper and they have exposure to better growth overseas. Julia, uh, the chairman has said uh, we need to see inflation that's significant and persistent. There are some out there who think that 2020 will be a year of surprises of inflation to the upside, at least in food, for example. How likely do you think that is? Well, if we do get surprises to the upside in food, the Fed always looks through those types of uh, commodity shocks, whether it's energy or whether it's food. If we look at core inflation and the drivers of core inflation, there are just a lot of structural headwinds that offset the <coughs> cyclical pressures we see. So we've not even managed to get to their 2% target, even with what we estimate to be a quarter point contribution to core inflation from tariffs this year. So that, that means there's a lot of these, the, the technology disruption, the healthcare disinflation that comes from an aging economy, uh, the, the rental disinflation. We've had such a boom in rents that it's actually moderating now at the peak of the cycle. These are factors that are um, dampening that cyclical upward pressure that we might otherwise see. So I don't think that the Fed is going to have to hike rates based on inflation. And the real tricky thing for the, the committee is that in the absence of inflation, what if we start to see things that they worry about in terms of asset bubbles, uh, financial stability concerns? The chair is not somebody that worries a lot about that, but there are people on the committee that start to get nervous every time the, the stock market is soaring and business corporate debt is reaching record highs. So that might be more of a conversation on the committee in 2020. Julia, even if the Fed here holds steady and continues to, you know, watch the economy closely and, and, and move accordingly, the fact that we have so much negative yielding debt in other parts of the world, do you think we're going to see a shift at some of these central banks, places like Europe, where they start to say, maybe we've gone too far and, and, and look at ways to rein that back in? Rein that back in, you mean by raising interest rates? Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think that's the direction they're going in. I do think that the fact that we do see so much negative yielding de debt around the world highlights the constraints that the Fed faces and what's something that they had to face this year. When the global economy was slowing and yields were going the other direction, the Fed had to follow suit even if the U.S. economy was basically okay. So I think we are in global markets and we are in a very low growth, low inflation, low interest rate environment. Whatever, what breaks us out of that is not immediately obvious. So China is actually starting to face the same kind of demographic pressures, slow growth pressures that Europe and the U.S. and Japan have been facing for years. So there really isn't an obvious engine of sort of that cyclical growth. And we're all kind of confronting these 
you know, demographic trends that keep us in this low, in, uh, low return, low interest rate environment. And I think that's a reality that the Fed is going to face. So um, I don't think that Europe goes the other direction anytime soon, um, nor does Japan. Uh, and the UK is actually looking at possibly cutting, uh, de depending on how hard Brexit hits their economy. But a lot of these factors are structural and not cyclical. I mean, I think if inflation rises because growth is better, I think investors will be able to deal with that a whole lot better. I don't see huge inflation on the rise, right? Yeah. So that's why, because I don't see yeah. growth huge on the rise. I do think it's going to inflect a little bit better next year globally, but not enough on, on the inflation side. So that it should be like a kind of a Goldilocks. All right.